Welcome to part three of my workbench series where I'll work on the top and wrap up this build. If you recall, this workbench is a split top design where one half is a traditional workbench and the other half is a modern assembly table. I started with the traditional hardwood top that's made from soft maple I got from Woodworker Source. I was aiming for a final thickness of three inches for this top, so for now, I ripped these planks oversized just to get them all to the same width. These planks will be face glued together to create the thick top, so I wasn't worried about cleaning up any edges at the jointer just yet. All I cared about at this point was that the planks were straight and flat on their faces, so I passed them through the jointer on one face, then sent them all through the planer on the opposite face. I really wanted this bench top to be perfect, so I milled these a little larger than I actually needed, then stacked and stickered them overnight, and repeated the milling process the next day to bring the boards to final thickness. First of the jointer, and finally the planer. I take off about a 16th to an eighth here. Now when laying out these boards, it's best to make sure the grain is running the same way on every piece. This way, when you're planing the top to final thickness, there'll be no tear out because of changing grain directions. This isn't always possible, so I just do the best that I can and line them up so most of the grain is running the same way. I go through every board and decide which one I want on the show edge and place them in an order that looks good to me. This process actually takes me longer than it should. All right, quick prayer to the glue gods and it's time to glue them up. There's a total of eight planks here, but I'll be doing two glue ups of four planks each. So I'm splitting this glue up in half. This way I don't have to worry about making sure all those edges are lined up and I can clean up each half after the glue dries. That's why I rip these oversized when milling. Another reason to do this glue up in halves, even at this point, these halves are super heavy. Each half is about six inches wide. So I was able to clean up one face at my eight inch jointer and then bring to final thickness at the planer. You can just go ahead and glue these two halves together at this point, but I really wanna make sure that these mating edges are seamless. So I did the in out method at the jointer. One piece is sent through the jointer with the top face facing out away from the fence. And the mating piece is sent through the jointer with the top face facing in towards the fence. This way, if the fence angle is slightly off, the opposite angles will match up perfectly. Just a precaution, but it works perfectly. Now that I've gone through the trouble of cleaning up the tops and making everything nice and smooth and even, I don't wanna have to do that again after gluing these two halves together. Dominoes, dowels, biscuits, splines are all great ways to keep multiple pieces level during the glue up, but they're only great if you set your tools correctly. cut on the 20 and not the 25. <gasps> this is a disaster, disaster. So even with high-end tools like the Domino, you can make a mistake. I forgot to change the cutting depth and the mortises were too shallow. So I wiped off all the glue, changed the setting on the Domino, recut the mortises. But as I was editing this, I was laughing at myself. What a waste of glue. I could have just trimmed up a few dominoes at the bandsaw to fit the existing shallower mortises. And lots of times I get comments saying, you should have done this, or why didn't you do that? Well, because in the moment I didn't think of it and we all make stupid decisions every once in a while. Only difference, mine are caught on camera. Almost a disaster. Crisis averted, now this bench top is super heavy. See how heavy this is? So I set up a sawhorse to help out with lifting it at the planer and have to walk it around my shop to move it anywhere. I did super light passes here just to clean up the glue mess that I made and magically the base of the bench is built. Just kidding, not magic. I posted that video a few weeks ago and it's part one of this bench build series. Once I got the heavy top on the base, I decided that's where it's going to stay. I don't wanna have to do that again. So I did everything else I needed to do while it was on the base. It was really cool to actually use the base as a workbench as I was continuing to build it. Anyway, the edges need to be perfectly square, so I used a track saw to trim them up, flipping the top to reach where the first cut could not. Then I spent some quality time with my hand planes until the edge was square and straight across. To get the opposite edge squared up, I did the same process, but this time I used a combo square to set the track saw so the cut will be parallel to the first edge. 
I thought about using a table saw to make this cut, but then I remembered how heavy this top is and its weight was the reason for my sprained ankle. So bringing the tools to the workpiece was the best option for me in this scenario. When doing the glue up, I left the boards long so that I wasn't worried about aligning them. So at this point, after the edges are squared up, I can trim up the top to find a length, again, using the track saw from both faces. And then I cleaned up all that burning with a sander. There's still a lot of work to do on this top. So I wanna make sure it'll always fall in the right position every time I move it around. I thought about using a large dowel as a locating pin, but the domino makes quick work of drilling perfectly placed mortises off of a referencing face. Now, every time I have to move this top, it'll go right back to where it's supposed to go. <laughs> Moving on to the torsion box assembly table part of this build. Top and bottom will be made from half inch MDF that I ripped to the actual width that I want. The top piece is going to get a piece of laminate glued onto it to make it a more durable work surface. I've never used laminate like this before, but I have done some veneer work and the process is pretty similar. I thought I could trim this thin lightweight piece of laminate at the table saw, but it was so large and unwieldy that I couldn't even lift it up to the saw. So I nixed that idea and remembered I had an acrylic cutting tool. So I clamped a straight edge to the laminate sheet and passed the cutter along the straight edge until it scored the material and then it just snaps, but not perfectly. I guess I didn't score it deep enough at some points. Now that the piece is not as large though, it's easy to trim at the table saw. I'm assuming this is a small girl problem and most people who would be building this would be able to lift a whole sheet at the get-go. I trimmed the sheet to length using the scoring tool, making sure it just scored deeper this time and it's time to attach it to the MDF. I used contact cement to do this. I really hate the smell of this stuff and I don't love the process, but it's really effective. Roll the contact cement on the MDF and the back of the laminate. Wait about 20 minutes for the contact cement to dry. Apply a second coat if it doesn't look glossy. Wait another 20 minutes for that to dry. Then apply the laminate to the MDF. I know it seems weird that you wait for the glue to dry before attaching the pieces, but if you do this correctly, once those two pieces touch, they will not move. So when putting the laminate down, put it on some spacer blocks or dowels so it does not touch the MDF just yet. Then start from the center, press down and work your way out, removing the spacer blocks as you go. A J roller is really helpful here in making sure there's a good amount of pressure to aid in adhesion. The laminate was cut slightly oversized initially, and that is so that you don't have to worry about aligning it perfectly when you do the whole contact cement thing. So a quick pass with a flush trim bit brings the laminate to the same dimensions as the MDF. We have the bottom and top pieces. Now we need the pieces in the middle that will create the torsion box. As per my design, there are going to be a few rows of dog holes in this portion of the bench. Dog holes are three quarter inch holes, and this is three quarter inch plywood. I wanna make sure the area around the holes are wide enough so that there are no visible gaps in the dog holes and you don't see inside the torsion box and nothing ever gets lost in there. So I'll glue up a few pieces to create wider supports just in those sections. They were ripped oversized before gluing them so that after they're dry, I can clean up one edge of the jointer then get the exact height I need based off of the top and bottom against the hardwood portion of the bench, then trim those to final height. Now that I have the perfect height already set up with the table saw, I'll rip the rest of the parts that make up the supports of the torsion box and I cut most of the parts to length at the miter saw. So these wider supports that are glued up are going to be in line with dog holes that I'll drill on the hardwood portion of the bench. So before placing them inside the torsion box, I need to know exactly where those dog holes are going to be. Pretty cool announcement. As of today, I'm selling a dog hole template on my website to help with the layout and cutting of dog holes. So this part should be really simple. The template's made of acrylic with center lines etched on the underside, so you can easily see where to place your holes. It also has tapped holes where you put bolts in place and they act as an edge guide. So using the bolts as an edge guide, I move the template along and use the etched center lines to mark off where all the holes are going to be. Now that I know exactly where the holes will end up, I can figure out the length of the pieces that will need to go between those wider supports. I did a few test cuts until I got the perfect fit, then cut the rest to size at the miter saw. 
These spacers will evenly space the wide supports so that their centers are 12 inches apart. And after laying them all out, I can figure out how long to cut the spacers for the outer bays. The plans include measurements for all these parts, but I just find it's more accurate to use your actual real life work pieces. Okay, time to glue it all up. I planned the order of operations here. I knew that I need a completely flat and level surface to glue the torsion box together. That's why I made the hardwood top first. I could use it to clamp onto and make sure this remains super flat. This process is not hard. There are just multiple steps. Glue and clamp one long edge. Once that's dry, glue and clamp the second long edge. At this point, the MDF is already feeling super solid, but let's reinforce it some more. When gluing these, I used the spacers to make sure the spacing was perfect. And I had a situation where I didn't need to use any clamps in the center of these supports because the MDF I was using was bowed down on the outsides. So when I added two clamps to the outer edges, it just brought up those sides and it all became flat. After using the spacers for placement, I moved them out of the way because I didn't want glue to stick to them just yet. That's the next phase of this glue up. I did feel like these spacers needed clamping for the middle. So I moved the whole assembly to the flat hardwood worktop and used some calls to place pressure in the middle of those and press them down towards the flat worktop. You can also brad nail these into place if you don't have enough clamps. I'm going to attach these tops to the base using lag screws. I don't think half inch MDF is strong enough to hold that in place. So while the top is still open, I glued maple blocks in the locations where I know the screws will go. I know these locations because I already drilled recessed holes in the apron of the base in part one. I've seen some torsion box videos where they sand all the support pieces flush to each other after this step, but I'm happy to report there was no sanding required here. All the pieces were smooth and flush with each other. When running a straight edge across, nothing is catching. On a high note from how well this was turning out, I decided to glue on the top. This part was the trickiest. I tried my best to get even pressure across the whole top by first placing down another piece of plywood, then putting calls down the whole thing. And when clamping long calls, the middle tends to bow upwards. So I put some thin scraps in there to force pressure in the center. This was a good idea in theory, but there was actually too much pressure in the center. I'll show you guys in a little bit. I decided to make this portion of the assembly table a bit fancy by adding some walnut trim around all the edges. It's totally not necessary, but this will be featured in every one of my videos moving forward, so it should look nice. Another thing that will be featured in all my future videos, this Laguna 14BX bandsaw. I've been eyeing this bandsaw for a while and I was thrilled when Laguna offered to send me one. In my opinion, Laguna makes the coolest looking tools, but they don't just look cool. They're amazing machines and the assembly for this tool was about 10 minutes, which is awesome. I've always struggled with consistent resawing in the past, no more. I've been eyeing this machine for a while, but I've also always wanted to try Laguna's legendary Resaw King blades. And there is no going back to regular blades for me. As a thank you to all my viewers, Laguna was able to offer a 10% discount on parts and accessories from the Laguna store. So check out the link down below and use the code TAMAR10 if you wanna try out this blade or other Laguna accessories for yourself. Back to the walnut trim. These pieces could probably just be glued to the edges of the torsion box and you'd be fine. But again, alignment. And in this case, I needed to address the little dip in the top I made when gluing it up. As you can see, the light is shining under the straight edge, which means there's a gap. No bueno. So I ripped a scrap piece of plywood to be slightly taller than the cabinet opening and clamped the edges, which would simulate when I screw it all down and voila, no more light. So. My thought process here was to keep that middle lifting scrap in place while I did the glue up and the dominoes will also help keep it all straight. And it totally worked. After one long edge was good, I glued on the short sides with dominoes and finally put the last long edge in place all while the scrap spacer was lifting up the middle and clamped down to the aprons. Crisis averted. Let's move on to some work holding. 
I decided to go with this tail vise from HNT Gordon and I used my dog hole template as a guide for its location. The tail vise needs to be in line with a row of dog holes in order for it to function properly. So with the bolts placed in my jig, I know exactly where those holes will go. I use the etched center lines on the jig to make a center line for the tail vise, then use the included instructions to get the rest of the dimensions marked out. The idea of cutting into my brand new workbench top was really nerve wracking, but a good setup with my six in one jig eased those nerves a bit. I lined up the right edge of a quarter inch bit with the right pencil marking and double side taped a hard stop to the underside of my jig. Now I adjusted the fence on the jig so the left side of the bit was touching the left pencil line and locked the fence in that position. Next, I moved the router so the back of the bit was touching the back layout line and double side taped one of the extra fence pieces directly to the bench top. Now it's just a matter of taking multiple passes, lowering the router after each pass until you get to the desired depth. After getting that first line to final depth, I could adjust the fence over about a quarter inch to make the next cut. I keep doing this over and over again, adjust fence, cut, lower bit multiple times, adjust fence, again, until I get to the hard stop that I double side tape to the underside. That's the final pass and it's a perfect fit. Awesome. Next up, I route the space for the cover plate that's going to be the thickness from the top of the vise to the top of the workbench. Same as before, I double stick tape a hard stop to the bench for the back of the cut and adjust the fence on my jig for the sides of the cut. I thought it would be a nice touch to make this cover plate out of some scrap walnut from the draw fronts. This was actually really fun to make. I resawed a piece almost to the desired thickness at my new awesome bandsaw, which has a foot pedal to stop the blade, by the way. Then I ripped it to width at the table saw and it was a perfect fit. Well, almost. The corners need to be knocked out, which is easy to do with a corner chisel. Now it's a perfect fit. The tail vise will have a dog that moves forward and backwards, so a notch needs to be created so it can slide. I made the notch by drilling two holes with a Forstner bit, then adjusted the fence on my router table using the hole as a guide, then connected those two holes. The plate will be held down with screws, and you have to make sure to countersink those holes so the screws will sit well below the surface of your bench. I decided to use brass screws because, well, brass, but they're notorious for breaking when you drive them into hardwoods. A little bit of screw wax and they go in super smooth. Now that the plate's held down, it can be flushed to the surface of the bench with a hand plane. Super fun. Now for the dog holes. This template is really easy to use and it has exactly what you need to use it etched right on the jig. A 3 8 outer diameter bushing with a quarter inch straight bit. My six in one jig has a recess that's meant to be used with a guide bushing. It locks right into place and it's ready to be used. If you don't have a set, I will have this set available for you to purchase on my website. A guide bushing basically turns any router bit into a pattern bit. That's how I did the floating tenants for the base. Anyway, I already know exactly where the first hole will go because I laid all that out earlier when figuring out the spacing for the wide inner supports on the torsion box. So all I need to do is make one mark and line up the jig using the etched center lines and included bolts. I won't bore you with all this boring, but it's pretty repetitive. I remove the included bolts because they'll get in the way of my router base, but you don't need them anymore after this anyway. After you drill your first set of holes, you're gonna use the holes you just drilled out to get the next set of holes in the perfect spot. When you use this template, you end up with three quarter inch holes. So on the jig itself, there are actually two rows of three quarter inch holes. This is where this is so cool. To move to the next set of holes, you put a three quarter inch dowel or a dog in the hole on the jig that goes right into the three quarter inch hole you just made. If you were drilling two rows of holes, you could use the second three quarter inch hole. And when adding holes further away from the edge of the bench, you can use the three quarter inch holes that are on that front edge. This is just so easy to quickly place down and keep on drilling accurately spaced dog holes. I used very little double-sided tape to hold the template down and I didn't even replace it after every move and it worked out great until the end. On the assembly table, I already know where I want the holes there. It was all laid out when I was assembling it. So I just need to 
make a center line that the etched center lines on the dog hole template can reference. Rinse and repeat. I just plunge until I can't plunge any further to create the hole. A little tip here. Before you do the last plunge, just vacuum out the hole that will remove any sawdust that will get trapped between the bushing and the jig. Then your final pass should be nice and clean. This template has a total of nine holes that you can drill at one time. So if you're making a table with a lot more holes, this would be perfect for drilling a lot at a time. It's cool that it could be used in different ways though, like on this portion of the bench, I'm skipping the middle hole, always options. It's really hard to capture placing the etched lines on a center mark. So I hope this is coming through and I hope you guys like this new product. Really looking forward to hearing your thoughts. My bench actually turned out to be thicker than three inches. It's about three and a quarter. So I couldn't plunge all the way through with the bit that I had. No problem, just drilled out the rest of the holes with this awesome overdrive bit. This is the bit that I used when I made the dog holes on my portable workbench. I liked using the router better, but this is still a great bit. If using a bit like this, you still need to make a template to make sure all the holes are straight and perfectly spaced like I did in that other video. On to the front vise. Lots of options here. I went with one from HNT Gordon. I did a lot of research on this for months before actually pulling the trigger and purchasing it. It's pricey, but this is my dream bench. The vise is meant to be used with a top that's three inches thick, but I just mentioned, I actually ended up making mine a quarter inch thicker. So I needed to route out a quarter inch pocket for the vise to sit in. Once again, the six in one jig to the rescue. With the stops and fence in place, it's basically acting as a makeshift template. Perfect fit and the vise just gets bolted into place. There are already lots of installation videos on these vices. I wanted to add a row of dog holes in line with the center of the vise, but realized drilling all the way through would interfere with the actual vise, so I did something really fun. I made pop-up dogs, or as one of my Instagram followers said, prairie dogs. These are made from three quarter inch dowels that I made from scrap walnut. I milled a piece to three quarter square at the planer, then set up a three eighths round over bit at the router table. Did some test cuts on all four sides until I got a perfectly round shape, then made the round over on all four sides to create the dowel. I have a whole video on making dowels if you're interested in learning more. Off camera, I used the dog hole template to make holes in line with the vise, use calipers to get the depth of those holes, then set a stop lock at the cross cut sled to cut them slightly longer than that depth. In order to hold these short dowels at the drill press, I made little notches in my hand screw clamps at the bandsaw. Now the dowels are held in place while I drill a hole in the end grain. These holes need to be as deep as these push latches are. I got 10 of these on Amazon for 15 bucks. This is so simple. Just push the latches into the hole and done. Only caveat here, you need a 10 millimeter hole. I happen to have a set of metric bits just for occasions like this. So fun. The dowels didn't fit right away, so I chucked them up in a drill using the latch and sanded until it was a nice fit. To make them fit even nicer, I added wax. I tried using a flush trim saw to cut to final length, but the dowel kept rotating around and it didn't leave a nice cut. So I just scored around the whole dowel with the flush trim saw, put it in my brand new vise, cut it along the score line and played with it a billion times. Just a quick pass with the block plane and now they're perfectly flush and really fun to play with. Last feature on this bench is the gap stop. I was planning on just using this one walnut board, but it was severely bowed, so change of plans, I'll make a sandwich. I resawed the board into two smaller pieces that I could get nice and flat, the bread of the sandwich. Then I resawed a piece of maple that will be glued in between, the cheese, I guess, and then cut the cheese into smaller pieces that will create gaps in the gap stop that will act as tool holders. I laid out my most used tools to get measurements that would work for me and I glued it all up. The first piece in this glue up, I used wood glue and CA glue. The CA glue will act as a clamp and will quickly set up and dry so I can push all the spacers and rest all the pieces up against that first piece without anything sliding around. Then I added the top walnut piece, clamped it all up and took out the spacer so they wouldn't get stuck to the glue and set it off to dry. When I milled these pieces, I milled them to be slightly wider than I actually need so I can clean the whole thing up after the glue dries. One pass on the jointer, then cut to final height at the table saw and bring to final thickness at the planer until it slides right between the two halves of the bench. 
The gap stop is taller than the workbench top, so it needs to be notched out where it hits the base aprons. Using a combo square, I get the notch depth and it's already so fun to be able to use this vise to cut them up and to use the dog holes to hold down the work pieces. One final pass with a template bit in a router to bring to final depth, chamfer those corners and it slides right onto the aprons, perfectly flush with the tops. All the dog holes get a slight chamfer with the router. Everything gets a final sanding and all edges are eased over. Lots of people in the base video thought I wasn't going to make this bench mobile. Of course I'm making it mobile. I bought these way back in April when I was planning this bench and the installation was pretty simple, especially with the drilling templates they provided and even simpler with this spacer block I made based off of their template. Moment of truth, it moves around super easy. Not a bad Amazon find. Finally, it's time for finish. I knew I wanted something that was easy to apply and I could just add more finish whenever I needed to. So I went with Minwax Antique Oil Finish. It's my first time using it, but it's basically like a wipe on poly. I made sure to finish both sides of the bench so it doesn't warp and man, those walnut draws look good. Final step, attach the tops to the base using three inch lag bolts through the recessed holes I drilled out when building the base. And it's done. Well, almost done. I still have to put another coat of finish on here and a layer of wax, but it's basically done. This was a labor of love and it took three months of my life to finish. So I cannot wait to build my first project on this. Let me show you everything that it can do. First up, we have the tail vise. So a dog goes into here. And remember I made that slot so that dog can travel like that. And then there is more dogs that have three quarter inch shafts that go into the three quarter holes that were drilled out. So this is great for clamping up small objects like this. And if you want to do larger objects, that's why the holes run along here. So you would find the next hole, move this back, and you can use this all the way down the length of your bench, all the way to the last hole to accommodate longer pieces. So this goes in there and adjust here. Now this long piece is nicely secured down to your bench and you could do anything you want. You could use a hand plane, router, sand, chisels, whatever, your piece is not gonna move but it's not limited to the length of your bench. You can actually use this and extend your bench. Let me show you. So I have this long piece here that's longer than the length of my bench when I butt it up against the dog on the vise. So I could use my front vise to create an extension fence. Literally, all you need to do is take any long board and put it in your vise, extend it so that it's further than your piece, and rest it on one of the dogs that are on the side of the bench here. Now, just clamp a block to the end of it, tighten that down in the vise, push it up against the stop, and secure it with the tail vise. Now this piece that's longer than your bench is secure and you could work on it. Now this is just a temporary thing here that I clamped it. You could make something more permanent and screw it. You could build something that has support from underneath and just clamp it in the vise. A lot of different options here, but you're not limited to the size of your bench. Another really cool feature for a tail vise is to turn your bench into a shooting board. Just make a board that's like quarter inch uh, MDF, drill some holes using the dog hole template as a guide, and then put some dowels on the underside. Now these dowels will go into the dog holes on the bench. Now place a work piece so that it's just hanging over the edge of the MDF. So the dog that I got to go in the tail vise is only a quarter inch high, so it doesn't, reach this material. So all I did was make another one with a uh, half inch dowel and plop that in there and your work piece will stop against that. Now put a dog in one of the holes in the MDF straight through the bench. Push the work piece up against it and tighten that down.
Now with your hand plane on edge, you just run it along the piece on your workbench, turning your workbench into a functional shooting board. And just something to note, the template that I'm selling has the perfect distance from the edge to turn your workbench into a shooting board like this. All right, now let's talk about the front vise. I chose this vise because it's very minimal, yet it has a ton of functionality. It's a non-racking vise, so I can clamp something way out here and it's completely clamped. And over here as well, totally clamped, nothing is shifting around here. So what I like about putting this at the edge of my bench is that I'm able to clamp this here and then use it to cut this way. You guys already saw me clamp up a long board, but the reason for these holes over here is to support long pieces as I get them into the vise. Now, this is super strong in here. I can even run along here and plane this edge. No problems at all. That's actually really fun, okay. <laughs> the reason for these dogs down here is to support longer, heavier pieces. Like when I was cutting in the mortises for these legs, I had to hold them up as I was tightening my moxin vise and it just makes it a little bit less comfortable. So I just put a dog in there and now I could just rest the work piece on there while I tighten up the vise. This whole clamping situation also works for big wide panels. So I rest the piece on the dog on the leg, tighten down the, the vise, and then I can add another clamp using the holes that are in the side of the bench. And this piece is not going anywhere. Now for the pop-up dogs. So these are in line with the vise here and they're meant to hold a piece and quickly clamp it um, with the vise. And normally there would be a dog in the vise here and it shows that on the website, but you have to drill your own hole. I'm just not ready to do that yet. So I made this quick little thing that goes over the vise. This is just a prototype. I like made it in 10 minutes. And this way I can quickly clamp against those pop-up dogs there. So we'll see how I like that. And if I like this clamping situation, then I'll go ahead and drill for the dog in the actual vise. While I was making this though, I found a use for these pop-up dogs here, which is pretty awesome. Um, it, the fit was just a little bit too tight, so I needed to pare it down a little bit. And I just popped them up and pushed against it with my chisel to shave off a little bit of material. And it was great in a pinch. They can also be used as a planing stop in this direction. So you just butt the workpiece up against it and plane away. Now the gap stop in the middle is made so that it's completely flush. So no pieces get caught along here. So just in case you need a flat surface, but sometimes you want to quickly have a surface to butt up against. Like if you just want to quickly plane something this way, or you can use it as a stop if you are cutting something. I have a pull saw, so I would hold it back here and then cut. The piece is being pulled against the, uh, the gap stop and it's supporting it. If you have a push saw, you would hold it this way and cut that way. It falls right back into place and these holes in the middle are to hold some tools that I frequently use so that they don't roll off the bench or they're just not in the way and if I need more surface area. So this was a last minute addition and I know some people like this, some people don't like this. We'll see, this is always a piece that I can change and swap out if I find that this isn't useful for me. Now for the assembly portion of the table, I was really nervous that I messed it up when I did the glue up but because of that fix with the post, it is nice and flat now. So I was debating whether or not to glue this in or to make it replaceable. I decided to glue it in, but a good idea might be to screw it down and make it replaceable. I just didn't want to have any hardware in the bench. So this is how I would use it. I could clamp up some pieces with some holdfasts in these holes that are here. 
And now this piece isn't going anywhere and there's a few holes here. So lots of different configurations that I could do there. Could also use this type of hole down where you put that in the hole and clamp it like that. And I chose to do the laminate on this section so that I could glue on here and put finish on here and it'll pop right off and it's going to be really durable. Um, if I don't end up liking this, I could just make a new half of this bench. The base is amazing. Everything else is really the way that I want it. And the tops could be changed out in the future if I don't like this setup, but I guess I'll have to use it to see. I know I already love having this second shelf here. As I was building this, I kept resting things and leaving things on here. And this shelf here is just probably one of my favorite features of this whole thing. And there's so much storage in these drawers. The side panel over here is some really valuable real estate. I feel like there's a lot of uses for this over here for storage. I just haven't settled on that yet. I know that I definitely want to uh, put this like glue bottle holder here and maybe have a roll to hold my parchment paper for glue ups and maybe even some clamp storage. But I wanna use the bench a little bit first before I completely settle like where I want the glue bottle and the glue brushes and all that stuff. So you'll see some of those additions in the next couple of months. Well, that's it for the bench building series. I really hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I did. I really can't stop looking at it. So thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you on the next one where I'll build a project on my brand new bench. So awesome.